Hey, good evening. Uh, we call the uh, regular council meeting to order. Um, before we adopt the agenda, I just wanted to make uh, mention, uh, I think council has heard this news, but for those who didn't, uh, uh, late Mayor George Pearson passed away, fourth mayor of, of uh, Colwax uh, passed away, he had some health troubles, and uh, we do have some cards uh, for your signature, and we'll be sending some flowers to his son and partner, uh, companion uh, Lois. Um, so we're going to honor him with a minute of silence. Is it worship? When did he pass on? Two days ago. Yesterday. There was an email. Just turning my ringer off. Okay, so a minute of silence, please. Thank you. Um, no details yet on uh, services of any kind, so uh, we'll keep you updated as we know more. So with that, uh, we'll adopt the agenda. Motion to adopt, please. Move. Second. And adoption, all those in favor? Motion is carried. And uh, we do have del delegations this evening. First of all, we have Daryl Cowan and other members of the Civilians Theatre Society here, and I understand Daryl will be presenting to us on their five-year financial plan, so welcome, sir. First off, good evening, Town of Comox Council. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to talk to you. Uh, my name is Daryl Cowlin. I'm the president of the board of directors at Sid Williams Theatre. I'm also a resident of Comox on Night Road. So if you want to talk sewer, we can talk that too. But. <laughs> um, with me this evening is Marty Douglas. He's our vice president. Heather McFetridge, which you'll treasure. And Deborah Rent is, is the Sid Williams general manager. Our society has not had the opportunity to make a presentation to the Comox Council for several years, and we are glad to be able to do so today because of the great deal of progress we've been made in refining the operation of the theater. Most of you will recall five years ago that we were struggling to meet our operational cost and service commitments. We asked you to make an investment in the future of the community of the theater and the future of the Comox Valley's cultural resources, and you did, and we thank you. We hope you are pleased with the decision, and we think the citizens of Comox Valley do. Today we are operating within our budget and are meeting our challenges. In addition, we have established a reserve of funds in accordance with the prudent expectations of our future needs. That fund is still modest, but we're on track to see it grow to a point it needs to be in the coming years. The accomplishment is being achieved through a number of measures, some of which we would like to underscore for you. They are. Both rental bookings and society-sponsored events under the Blue Circle banner have been expanded. We have increased the number of our commercially successful events to what is probably the maximum number of days we can function per year. This has led to an increase in ticket revenue, which has helped the theater's sustainability. <coughs> the management team has worked hard to improve operational efficiency in all departments without sacrificing safety or service. Having stretched our events operations to the maximum, largely in response to regional competition and community user demand on the facility, we continue to work on increasing our attendance numbers through various marketing campaigns. We have reviewed and updated all of our operational and board policies to create a contemporary policy manual for our society and for the theater which meets current standards in living performance industry as well as those required by the government nonprofit organization. Some of the other steps we have taken, we have created strong active board committees to steer key initiatives in fundraising, policies, nominations, bursary awards, marketing and sponsorship, and human resources and a formal occupational health and safety program. As a result, we've been able to review, update all of our planning documents. We have created a strategic planning protocol, which is reviewed annually. Our comprehensive human resources plan is also reviewed regularly. 
The Board's Marketing Committee prepares a competitive marketing plan annually for promotion and sponsorship of our programming and to raise a profile of the theatre locally, regionally, and island-wide. We are now working to expand our operating and capital budget process to be sustainable for three to five years in a time frame. There is still much work to be done as we strive to fulfill the mandate we are given and the needs of a growing and changing community in the Comox Valley. A summary of our key strategic goals are we are continuing to develop new sources of revenue through sponsorships to support programming as well as improvements to the lobby of the theatre and upgrade historical and artistic exhibits on the theatre premises. As of Fall 2016, all programs are currently sponsored except for our volunteer program which we hope soon will be sponsored. We are continuing to improve the quality of our statistical data in order to better communicate with our municipal and regional partners with regards to theatre usage and the service that we provide to patrons and performers from all of our Valley's communities. We look forward to playing a role in any planning at the municipal and regional level for the future of the Comox Valley cultural services and cultural facilities. The Legacy Donation Program has been developed to assist with future equipment acquisitions for the theatre and to support major operational and programming needs. One of our mounting challenges is keeping the theatre equipped at a level comparative with our other island facilities. Our funding scenario serving three municipalities with a capital project funding coming from only one of these entitles puts us constantly behind the capital campaigns at other theatre facilities on the island such as Port Theatre, the Tidemark Theatre in Campbell River and the Cowlitzon Theatre. Our staff and volunteers have worked very hard to establish a high professional standard for our operational services. We need to keep our equipment inventory up to this same high standard but we will need help to do this. We are not here today to ask for a major increase in financial support from the town, town of Comox to the Sid Williams Theatre. However, we are asking that you consider a rate of gradual increase to our operation, operating subsidy that is accurately reflects the imp, sorry, imp, inflammation or costs impacting our local economy. We are also asking in the future that we be given the opportunity to bring special proposals before you regarding specific capital projects. Equipment purchases or other unique needs may arise. Four of our nine board members are Comox residents. This ratio closely reflects the number of your, our patrons, members and user groups residing in the town of Comox. We take our relationship with all our municipal and regional partners very seriously. We thank you for your ongoing support of our community theatre. Our board members uh, present today, uh, assisted by our general manager, will answer any questions you might have. Copies of our most recent strategic plan, financial plan, and comparative usage statistics will be available in a handout. And copies of our most recent annual report, which are limited because our AGM is coming up soon, have been given to the town of Comox staff. I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Any questions from members of council for the delegation? Council Ken. Yes, thank you for that report, and uh, we had that in advance, which was helpful. Uh, just to refresh council's mind is that, uh, can you uh, tell us about the grants from the Village of Cumberland? <coughs> there is one. Anyway. None. Okay. And uh, how does it work with the City of Courtney and for your grants to, to, to the Sid Williams? You, uh, how does it work? We have, I'll, sorry, I'll stop. <laughs> that might be easier. We have a uh, five-year management agreement with the City of Courtney, and in that agreement we present a financial plan. And you know, typically at this point, the City of Courtney guarantees us a certain amount of core funding, and then they're providing inflationary increases to that, as well as uh, we submit a capital budget, and that, the capital budget is more in the annual process as opposed to a five-year process, but that's generally how it works. Just for the uh, for my information, what's the core funding of the city of Courtney? Do you mean the dollar amount? Yeah, so that's actually in front of you, but for 2017, for example, the, com the combined funding from the city of Courtney 
Uh, their basic grant is $105,000, and then the management fee that they send us is $181,000. So that's you know, $389,000, $390,000. Um, and that's, that does not include capital funding, so for purchasing you know, any major theatrical equipment, and it does not include any uh, infrastructure r and that they do on the facility that's on their books, not on our books. If that helps. There's a, on the um, very back of, of the handout that I gave you, there's a little bit of ratio and, and uh, comparisons in color, which is always nice. <laughs> Any other questions? Go ahead, Councillor. Thank you. Um, the Sid Williams Theatre has been a very important part of my life, having children and grandchildren who have formed and rehearsed there for many, many, many years. So I recognize the value of having that theater in our Comox Valley. And that leads me to my question, which is, if you don't serve just Courtney, you don't serve just, the Com just Comox, have you ever presented your case to the CBRD? Yes. You have. Uh, okay. So that leads me in then. So what has happened? When did you do it? Uh, how did the, so the Comox Valley Regional District, uh, they established a five-year agreement with us as well, which we're into the third year of. And in that five year, the first installment of that five-year agreement, um, and there's some, there's some deliverables, of course, stated in the agreement, but in terms of funding, the agreement started out at $15,000 annually, and it's working its way up to $25,000 at the end of, you know, when we're into our fifth year. Then we would make a fresh presentation to them again to see if they would increase, um, you know, increase, if needed, their subsidy to us. We've also made, and I, you know, Daryl may mention this in his presentation, but we've also made a very similar request to uh, the CBRD that if we have a unique capital um, campaign for a major equipment purchase, whether we could approach them as well to ask for their participation. And uh, I think everyone here understands the importance of that in terms of leveraging provincial and federal funding. So the more funding that we're able to you know, raise ourselves through donations or, or fundraising, and the more that the municipal and regional partners might be willing to put in, that brings more federal money to our community. And I know for a fact the Department of Canadian Heritage, because of Canada 150, the Department of Canadian Heritage, was, which funds a lot of cultural spaces, they have received a new Fusion of funding, so going forward, we're going to look at a couple of key campaigns that we would at least like to come talk to you guys about. Yeah. Sounds good. Great. Thank you very much. Good. Any other questions? Just um, with respect to capital campaigns, uh, you don't have one currently in your way, do you? We do not have a current capital campaign, no. No, we aren't. And would you be doing, if you were due to do one, would you be doing one to the general public as well? Yes. As part of like you yes. sold seed, seeds and things like yes. that? Yes. That is correct. Uh, are we to talk about our dreams about our courtyard space, or is that just too visionary? That's too visionary. Too visionary. <laughs> <laughs> now, recently, we had a presentation by the people behind the Agriplex uh, awareness yeah. centers, yeah. and of course, they're talking about a capital campaign as well. So maybe other competition out there, but of course, uh, you're always welcome here to uh, make presentations of uh, what you're doing and what you what you might need. Uh, we have budget discussions carrying on. Uh, again next week, so it's a timely presentation. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, thank you for your presentation. Thank you, everybody. All right, so the next delegation is uh, Derek Jensen, uh, from Consulting Services regarding 1182 Lazo Road. Welcome, Jensen. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is uh, Derek Jensen with Mac Money Consulting, and I would like to take this time to provide a brief overview of the proposed single-family residential developments proposal at 1182 Lazo Road. Um, in light of the extensive and detailed report uh, provided by Marvin and staff um, and included in today's uh, package to Council, I won't spend a significant amount of time uh, recounting all of the specific details of the application and, and the proposal, that all of the information is clearly articulated in that document, but rather, I'd rather spend a, a few minutes just going over uh, some of the highlights of the application and then provide um, some 
some response to, um, or bring forward perhaps, uh, some of the responses we, see, we, we received through the public consultation process and some of the amendments we've made to the uh, application to address those concerns. Um, so overall, uh, the road network, that being an extension of Forrester to Lazo Road with uh, interconnections to adjacent lots, that was initially derived as part of the Butchers Road area planning uh, back in 2006. The proposed R32 zone is consistent with um, the balance of Forrester Ave. My predecessor, Frank Denton, made an application to council for 32 zone at the far north end of, of uh, Forrester Ave. On behalf of Frank Wetmore, I came forward at a later date on behalf of my development uh, for R32, and then subsequent to that, on behalf of the Comox Land Corp for the property immediately north. Uh, a total of 19 single-family lots are proposed. Um, there are some variances, uh, mainly with respect to lot one, which is essentially lot depth and setback variances as a function of the required uh, connectivity to Sandcliff Road. Um, beyond that, there is a variance requested for an alternate road cross-section consistent with the town's draft um, uh, road cross-section towards um, let's say uh, marginalizing or reducing the, the um, preference for the road network uh, from vehicles and, and transferring some of that uh, usage onto pedestrians and, and other users. Um, a 12 meter wide uh, linear park is proposed across the Lazo frontage and ultimately with the, the development adjacent next door by somebody else Hopefully at some point in the not too distant future, there will be a 12 meter wide park, connect, park corridor, uh, which will link ultimately, hopefully, um, the Torrance Road all the way out to the Lazo Marsh. So in addition to the 12 meter wide linear park, uh, we've worked with town staff and we're also going to incorporate a bit of a, a leisure area in this area. The thought being is that we would introduce potentially some park benches or picnic tables to provide um, the public an opportunity for a bit of refuse, uh, refuse sorry, uh, during their walks or, or um, on their bicycle trips or what have you. Um, all of the municipal and utility services are currently located at the north end of the development site and were installed as part of the previous developments. Overall tree retention, uh, we're achieving 34% of the existing stems through either retention or, or replanting. Um, we've conducted uh, a wildlife assessment, we've conducted an arborist assessment, we've done a geotechnical assessment, and we've done a civil engineering servicing study, all supported in the application. So now I would like to just move forward to um, the summary of the pu public consultation submission. So we, we did uh, go through the two-stage process uh, as directed by the, the town's uh, uh, procedural uh, requirements and we actually received uh, quite a lot of interest in the application. Um, so what I've done is I've tried to you know, narrow down uh, all of the uh, comments received to the, the highlight kind of six or six or seven most prominent ones that were brought forward by multiple uh, members of the public. So the first being is that uh, there was a, uh, an impression that from the public that the proposal was too dense. And, and what we would comment to that is that the single family developments, that being the nine lot, 19 lots, um, represents a relaxation from what uh, the town's official community plan uh, supported for that uh, this particular piece of property, uh, which was um, a combination of both single-family duplex and triplex townhouse developments. Um, as I indicated, uh, the proposed R32 zone is consistent with all of the master planning that's been done for the Butchers Road area since 2006. And further, the proposal demonstrates an average lot size well above the, min the minimum allowable under the current land use plans, that being 350 square meters. Uh, we average in and around just shy of 500, I believe. 
Um, obviously, you know, very much the same as most application rezoning applications that come before council. There's always some critique with respect to vehicle congestion and safety on local roads. Um, the town's uh, transportation study suggests that uh, the 85th percentile, which is kind of deemed the level by which um, roads are judged for compliance and non-compliance with respect to speed, uh, Lazo Road and Forrester are both operating within that 85th percentile and both of the roads currently operating under uh, maximum capacity. Um, McElhaney and, and the town staff in concert with the developer have worked with town staff to actually implement this draft, what is currently a draft uh, to the city's or to the town, sorry, subdivision servicing bylaw for an alternate road cross section. And this alternate road cross section actually includes a six meter wide paved surface with uh, grade separated boulevards and, and sidewalks with pullout areas. Some of the benefits to this road cross section as it relates to speed um, are the narrowing of the intersections. Um, a lot of you might uh, have driven by, you know, through Rob Ave. The recent, recently completed first phase of Rob Ave in front of uh, uh, Cole Rob School. We introduced some narrowing of the curbs, bump out curbs at crosswalks and such. Those are all elements that reduce the field of vision for, for drivers and, and as a result uh, reduce uh, speeds. Um, in, in addition, it also provides uh, tree canopy imme immediately adjacent to the curb on this side as well as along the back of the sidewalk on this side. We've worked with the uh, public works departments and move utilities within the roads so we don't have that uh, street tree slash um, municipal infrastructure conflict and, and future operation and, and maintenance issues with those two uh, op op occupying the very same space. Um, beyond this, we through the through the referral process, we understand from our discussions with Larry Park at MLTI that MLTI is hoping to redo Lazo Road across the frontage of, of Lazo Road on the south and east sides back to the intersection with Guthrie. Uh, they're hoping to do that this summer, although you know obviously subject to funding, uh, that may or may not transpire. The, the intent is not to urbanize. Um, Lazo Road, but to introduce uh, a little bit wider asphalt surface and provide a formal uh, shoulder for pedestrian cyclists the same. That would uh, certainly alleviate some of the congestion, some of the congestion on Lazo Road, and certainly until such time as the park in the Greenway uh, is available for public use. The rural character of Lazo Road must not be impacted. Uh, we would suggest that uh, as a function of simply an access on Lazo Road at an existing driveway access, we're really not impacting the, the, the rural nature of Lazo Road. There are, there are no residential accesses to Lazo Road. There's a 12 meter wide buffer for, afforded to those people in the regional district on the south side of Lazo Road. Uh, Within that park dedication, as part of the development, we are uh, maintaining full tree retention within those park dedication, with the exception of there's a couple of, of hazard trees that we're going to deal with prior to transferring that, those lands over to the town. Um, the development must facilitate wildlife movement. So, as, as I indicated earlier, we've done, uh, we had current environmental evaluate the site with respect to wildlife corridors and such. Um, currently the property has an existing house here and there's a number of fruit trees that are in very poor health but spatially located throughout the site. So the thought is, is that once this park dedication corridor is established and the fruit trees are removed as part of the development, then the the desire for deer to migrate through the development as opposed to around the development is reduced. Um, quite what, what uh, we found more recently is that you know the, the fruit, if it doesn't get picked, lands on the ground, deer come and eat the, eat the, eat the fruit, and, and now we've got a wildlife corridor. But clearly that wouldn't be the case you know, moving forward.
Um, an extension of Forester should not connect to Lazo Road. So back in 2006, there was quite an extensive community con consultation process that was in, that was undertaken by the town towards understanding what is appropriate within this Butcher's Road area. Um, there was um, some some very vocal residents within the Butcher's Road corridor as to how this this parcel of land should be developed given its unique um, nature. So what was determined from what was the out, one of the outcomes of that discussion and, and, and public engagement process was that Butcher's Road should remain a rural road and, and narrow in nature and, sh and um, road connections to it should be discouraged. As such, when we did um, uh, Don Cameron's development on Butcher's Road as well as Frank Wetmore's development on Butcher's Road, we, we constructed a 12 meter wide road and the, the expectation is that 12 meter wide road is going to continue all the way down to Lazo Road and Butcher's Road isn't going to be urbanized to support an influx of vehicles from the balance of this forester area. In addition to that, this linear park greenway is something that the community is very much looking forward to and oppor opportunities to for further road connections beyond, I think it's Barber Place, which is just up here, should be discouraged. Every time that there's another interconnection to the existing, within this existing park, future park corridor, is another opportunity that restricts the pedestrians and, and, the, and the bicyclists from being able to freely move within that corridor. We have the, the road connection here, which is located at an existing driveway. So there isn't any tree removal or, or, or environmental impacts with respect to formalizing this intersection at Lazo Road than, in other, other, than it's otherwise there today. So we, we, we had some people bring some ideas forward about you know, cul-de-sacs uh, in here and, and rooting people back through the development. That became is, is problematic from a technical perspective in that the emergency services uh, distance from the dead end of the cul-de-sac back to Barber Place where they could get up to Lazo Road exceeds the 150 meter uh, maximum distance. So that kind of excused the cul-de-sac idea. Another idea was let's turn this out to Lazo Road. Again, we would, we would be impacting you know, essentially virgin uh, environmental space there as opposed to here and we've already got a road, Sandcliffe Road here, it makes a lot of sense to make a T or cross intersection there and then carry it through. So what, we're, what we've worked on with, with town staff is twofold. We've addressed both the speed concerns with respect to the narrower road cross section. In addition to that, we've, we've addressed the, the potential for cross cutting through again the speed reduction and the and the and the the alignment of this road through the proposed development to encourage those people that aren't actually accessing this development to stay on Lazo Road that would certainly be assisted with the with the MOTI coming through with their road improvements on Lazo Road. In addition to that, ultimately with the Greenway walkway being constructed here, you know that further reinforces the public's ability to uh, use that pedestrian corridor as opposed to walking on the side of Lazo Road, which is certainly less desirable and from both from a, a safety perspective and an aesthetics perspective. And finally, uh, the proposal should include a neighborhood park. Um, as I in indicated, there's, there's a park dedication. Um, the, 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 the programming of that park is more of a linear greenway than a recreational open space. Uh, we are proposing a, 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 a refuse area for people to relax and take a break there. Uh, but you know, beyond that, you know, there there are a number of green spaces, you know, within proximity of this of this property. There's the Highmore Park. There's the Lazo Marsh. Uh, Point Holmes is not far away. Uh, there's Brooklyn Creek Park, McDonald Park. So, um, according to the official community plan, there isn't. Uh, hasn't been designated a need within this property or even you know proximal to this, this property for that matter for more outdoor recreational space. And 
that's that's it. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Councilor Swift. Thanks, Derek. Um, could you talk a little bit about parking? And I, I can see the bump outs. Um, I'm assuming they would be used for parking. But uh, would it be street parking or not? No. So the direction the town is going is that these alternate road with this alternate road cross section and narrowing the streets is that. Um, On-street parking would be limited to these bump out areas only. Uh, you can see that there's um, pull-outs there, here, here. There's opportunities on these side streets as well. Um, beyond that, that that's essentially would be uh, unrestricted, you know, visitor or or other parking. Uh, the balance of the parking would be on-site, and the expectation is that people are going to very much like Dakota Place. Um, which we did uh, the couple, three years ago now, uh, just, just below the water tower in Lancaster, where uh, people are expected to utilize their private space for parking. So in addition to the area for the in the garage that people may or may not use for their car or for other stuff, um, there is quite a distance from, there's seven and a half meters from the front of the garage to the property line. Beyond that, there's additional area from the property line to the back of the sidewalk. So it would be reasonable to expect that there's sufficient room for four cars on site without, without question. Um, is, and, and, the, and the idea there is that, and, and Marvin could probably speak to this a little bit more, but we understand that it's all part of an evolution towards modifying the road cross section to for the betterment of pedestrians and other users and not focus simply on vehicles. And, and how many cars are accommodated in those bump outs? Uh, each one of these bump outs is one car. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six provided, as well as up here there's room for two more, so eight. Thank you. Councilor yeah, I think to piggyback on, on your question there, one of the concerns I heard very loud and clear knocking on doors was the other side on Forrester there where there's a lot of secondary suites up there. Right. There's a lot of congestion up there. So I guess through the mayor to our planner, in that area there, we would be allowing uh, homes to have the option of a secondary suite? Correct. Okay. Uh, the, lot, the lots wouldn't be large enough for a carriage house or anything, though I wouldn't imagine. Um, some zoning, and uh, they'd have to apply for a rezoning for right. an individual lot, and um, they would not be able to have a secondary suite and a carriage house. Right. So, so with the way you have it right here, Derek, you're just saying there is enough room for a secondary suite to have off-street parking. Because I could see the issue arising again where we have this neighborhood, and now there's a lot of cars on there. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, Marvin could probably elaborate on the secondary suite approval yeah. process. And, and the provision of parking therein, but you know, it, it, it's the expectation that having four available for four cars plus a garage mm -hmm. would be suitable for the majority of people's needs. If they need to modify their private properties to accommodate secondary suites or other, yeah, then idea. then then it's up to them, and they would have to demonstrate to to staff and council that they've made those provisions accordingly, because you know. Clearly, the expectation isn't that you know they're going to park on the street, and 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 that's going to be their secondary suite parking allowance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Planner. Um, and that zone has got a built-in provision such that, let's say, that somebody buys a unit, has a double car garage, closes their double car garage, mm -hmm. provides living space, that no matter what, that there will be a clear area. Free of buildings, 5.5 meters wide by 7.5 meters deep, so that no matter what goes occurs on the property, they have sufficient room to park two cars side by side, okay. each with its own access onto the street. Thank you. Hey, uh, Councillor Price, and then again. Yes, thank you. And, and, and I think the narrower street um, visually certainly uh, looks better. The, the roads through the rest of the development appear pretty wide and, yes, and in yeah. uh, off the main routes there's very little on street parking. Um, when you mentioned the boulevard, is that a grass boulevard? 
Yes, yes, it would be a grass boulevard maintained by the homeowner and include street trees. So the idea is that this boulevard, we could, what we're trying to do is, is narrow the road and then narrow the tree canopy as well. So these street trees on this side would be placed immediately behind the sidewalk and on this side we would place them actually in the boulevards and I believe there's a plan in the in the report to council that shows where the street trees would go but the idea is that we have this kind of narrowing effect of, of not only the surface features but also the vertical on the, on the street trees as well. And, um, and, and, I, and I realize it's really hard to keep existing trees in a particular when the single family housing and so 27 out of the 223 are going to be kept. Um, it did mention too in the Arborist report that uh, on lot 19, which is the, the largest lot, or the longest lot, mm -hmm. that those two trees, 149 and 152, which are for retention. But it, just, it did say, fingers crossed almost, that the building envelope uh, won't uh, impact on them. Is there any way that that envelope, because it, it would be nice to have some more certainty since it's, there's nothing built on there mm -hmm. uh, and, and they did think <coughs> that they were very uh, nice trees and worthy of being kept and they seem to be a little bit of um, this could work or perhaps not. Is there flexibility to say make the building envelope a little bit smaller? Yeah, we have in the, in the plan, in the, in the report, there's a plan in there that Regina has prepared which shows the existing retention trees. In addition to that, it shows where the tree, trees will be planted. And the intent is to uh, support those existing trees by planting two or more trees adjacent to to create clusters. And I don't have that plan in front of me, but we certainly understand and recognize the depth of Lot 19. And at the moment, we're, we're certainly not against retention of trees in, in, in rear yards. And, and for the, the focus of our tree retention has been in rear yards. As you can appreciate, these side yard setbacks and the building frontages become quite problematic towards tree retention. So we've identified uh, rear yards as the primary uh, locations for tree retention and, and tree supplementation. So I don't, like I say, I don't have that plan in front of me. It is included in the in the report to council, and um, but I don't have off the top of my head. I don't know which tree specifically we're referring to with respect to retention or. Yeah, it or says removal. there are a, a couple of mature uh, differences, but I just wonder. So there is that flexibility that because I understand it's going to be clear the trees that the arborist reckons well, suggests says right. that these trees really should be kept. Yep. Um, when, you know, before anything goes in the ground, uh, if it means moving that building envelope a small amount, uh, that will be taken into account rather than say, oh well. Yeah, we, like I say, we, we certainly recognize the depth of lot 19 and, and we certainly want to take into account, you know, if there's a tree uh, outside of the building envelope or proximal, there it is, right there. Oh. So let's, uh, if we can zoom yeah. up on that a bit. So we're speaking about these trees here, yes. yes. So these are all retention yes. trees. Yes. Yeah. Yes, in, in their report it did say for retention, but there was a little bit of concern that um, with the building envelope of that size they may be compromised. Right, so they won't be compromised. They so this, compromise. this this plan articulates the, the proposed trees to remain and those trees that are going to be removed. And then there's another plan included in your package which shows which has um, um, planting trees included in it as well. So, yeah, there's no intent to remove any of the trees in, in the backs of 19 or 18 as Great. part of the development. Great. And then and the recommendations of the arborists on how to protect them on at construction time, they will all be followed or will they be written in by the planning? Yes, time? absolutely. The yeah. Screening and yeah, that's all, yeah, that's all part of the construction drawing review process. Yeah. That, and it did say the uh, unsupervised removal of stumps is on the side is likely to compromise the health of the retention trees. So that all, all the 
information in that will be followed in? Yes, the, yeah. the Strategic Natural Resources, which did the Arborist Report, they are engaged by the owner through the course of development until such time as subdivision occurs. So they will be working with the contractor through the course of construction to manage uh, the tree removals as well as provide um, delineation fencing or others to ensure that those retention trees um, aren't harmed through the course of construction. And, and, and um, a final report will be issued to the town upon completion of the subdivision by the arborist confirming that those trees are in fact there and in good health. Great, thank you, I appreciate that. And yeah, I, I did sir, notice... Um, in the, is on the same subject? No. Okay, well maybe uh, we can get the council okay. to come back to you. Yes, I just uh, wanted to say two quick points. I'm uh, very happy to hear and read about the two early uh, uh, public engagement exercises that happened, and especially pleased to hear a utilization of some of the, of the responses of the, of the neighbors and public in your report here today. I know the neighbors appreciate that, and uh, certainly that was the council's intent when we were promoting the early engagement of public mm -hmm. in, in these exercises. So thank you for that. You bet. Just one, um, uh, it was mentioned in the comments too about standing water on the site because I know some areas uh, there is a water problem but uh, you are happy that that can be Absolutely, and absolutely, yeah. And the other thing I just wanted to ask, you, when you mentioned Lazo Road being upgraded, mm -hmm. uh, is that next year? Uh, Larry Park was hoping to get it done this year, but it, uh, it's obviously subject to uh, budget and financial uh, constraints. So uh, I haven't had uh, any conversations with Larry recently, but uh, that was certainly his hope. Sounds, sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, one I had, I think Councilor McKenna touched on, is the pre application consultation. I guess it struck me in reading this material, both the pre-application uh, feedback and then essentially the post-application feedback, that many of the concerns are similar. Can you highlight a few things that you feel that the development has, uh, I guess, uh, accommodated? I know you've touched on some of these responses, but in terms of changing the design and the form that it originally proposed? Um, I don't think the... the the lot configuration and road network, um, as as presented on that plan and presented on this plan, really hasn't changed. Um, there are limitations from which we can work based on um, overarching documents, whether it's the official community plan, you know, the Butchers Road local area plan, um, and and. Um, achieving continuity and, and, and access primarily to the adjacent properties. Um, what we focused our discussions and, and um, consultation with staff on was the road cross-section and, and, and speed and vehicles. And, and we worked with Marvin and Regina pretty extensively um, with alternate road, different types of road cross-sections. Um, we looked at, you know, bump boats, we looked at traffic circles, we looked at um, whether traffic calming measures were appropriate or they not appropriate and, and, and what not. So I would say en masse uh, our focus uh, towards um, understanding and reconciling uh, the public's uh, concerns was primarily focused upon the road cross section. Yeah, it's interesting because you, you will hear from people and see in some of the comments that they feel the roads are too narrow in, in parts of this, uh, these subdivisions. And when there's cars parked on both sides, it forces people to slow down. But in fact, that is the intent. That is the intent, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's certainly going to take a, uh, it's going to take a bit of time for people to, to get used to. You know, change always takes a bit of time for people to uh, to, to swallow or, or come to terms with. But I think the, the overall direction is appropriate. Um, it's just people got to get used to, you know, potentially having a little less asphalt available for the one-off type of need that they may or may not have, you know. They've got a friend coming from who knows where with a great big motor home. Well, you know, we're going to have to uh, think about things before you just show up. I saw that movie. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one. Uh, <laughs> Council 
the grant than the platter. Yeah. Just, uh, I used to live up on Slater Place, which is a little subdivision just up in front of there, and the, the road up there was quite a bit wider than what you're saying. And yeah. cars parked on both sides, and it was, the parking was a real problem there. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that you've really done a good job of addressing that here. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that this is more in line with what a lot of visitors farther up would have probably preferred at the time. But we live and learn and, and, and get better at it. Um, I, I'm also really glad to see that we have a subdivision with some single family lots coming. Um, we have a ridiculously overheated real estate market. I think, Marty, you would maybe agree with that? Or no, no, it's really good. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really good. But, you know, and, and one of the real problems is supply and demand. I mean, it's that, that's what that business is. And we have had no supply in our town for, I can't remember the last time we had a, we had a single family lot, except for maybe some Harold Long. So, I think this is a really good thing, and, and I think it's going to actually contribute to keeping some of our prices a little more in line if we can produce more supply on like this. So, yeah. Yeah. So, glad to see it. Yeah. Our town planner had his hand up. I um, just want to say the, the amount of work um, that uh, Derek put into this in terms of the cross section uh, and our understanding uh, as sort of the actual technical background on it was immense. Um, a lot of it um, did. Um, Support the long-standing policy direction um, for some dramatic improvements in terms of the out um, and just the final product. Probably one of the most principal ones is the literature is quite clear that unless you reduce the payment with the travel with to six meters or less, you will not see speed reductions. Um, the <coughs> when you have our our historic load pattern of nine meters, um, that will not. <coughs> Parking allows, it will not reduce speed unless you get 50% or greater on street parking. And we're not in the best, the most busiest neighborhoods we have when we get 50% or less. We do have the phenomenon though that there's only two cars on the entire block and they both park parked immediately opposite each other on opposite sides and restrict it down to one way traffic. So we're providing the first of we're not um, maintaining our traffic flow, the traffic flow, and yet we're creating a visual sight line for the city. Um, so that was inherent in this. That's why the, the tra two travel lanes, they're clear travel lanes, there won't be any impediment <coughs> to two way traffic or six meters. And then we have the pull out parking, um, and the pull out parking <coughs> sandwiches that we have are in keeping with what is currently being used. Uh, in our neighborhoods. So we did look at those those factors. Um, and again, a lot of that was the ability to have somebody from the development community and talk back and forth and actually um, look at ideas and work them through to uh, what the implications are of the engineering was immense. So, um, and I'm fully anticipating that our new subdivision by our local road standards will be massively better because of it. So. And, and do you think, as I asked Eric, that uh, the pre-application consultation was an important part of that process in creating this um, particular road network? The I think that um, reading through the letters, it was obvious that there was a lot of um, appreciation for the pre-application consultation. Um, the new information or information that wasn't known prior to undertaking it. Um, there really wasn't much new information that came forward. So the concerns about speeding and, and things like that. And if anything, it reinforced our existing um, understanding. Um, unless directed otherwise by council, um, it wouldn't be our intent for single family rezones um, to require the uh, pre-application consultation, we would limit it to multifamily um, and to other um, other land use forms. Okay. Tristan, thank you. Um, yeah. Just one quick question. Uh, on the pre-consultation uh, uh, process, mm -hmm. uh, is there, are people made aware or is this something that maybe we need to do in the future that the comments they make in that process do not form part of the public hearing? And I assume they don't. The comments that, um, so in this case, when we go to public hearing, all comments received during the pre-application uh, process, whether they were direct, uh, directed 
to McElhaney and included in their report or whether they were directed directly to the town will be included in the background binder. Okay. Our obligation is all information that council considers in determining whether or not to proceed with a rezoning bylaw has to be made available to the public in the background information bylaw so people are able to see what information has been presented to council and to present any alternative views that they may have. Councilor Dutt? Maybe I'll put the planner on the spot here, but I'm just wondering how long, you know, we've taken some steps to try and streamline the process and get some of the redundancy out of it, so I'm just wondering how long this process actually took and whether it was a better process than what we had in the past or, I know, I guess it would be wrong to ask the planner because he's going to agree, but maybe without putting you on the spot too much, is it a better process or are we still? I think the public engagement process has merit, so I think I agree with Marvin that it's probably more appropriate for multifamily kind of developments where there's development permit considerations because those type of applications have a form and character component which is discretionary and one person's view on form and character can be quite different than another's. With respect to single family residential, as I was alluded to earlier, the overarching land use plans, whether it's the OCP, the zoning, the boulevard traffic study, you know, the servicing bylaws, all those other things, they kind of dictate how the development has to play out. Beyond, you know, some minor changes as we've worked with planning with respect to the road cross section and such, this lot layout and road network is something that I derived back in 2006 when we were working for Frank Wetmore. So there isn't a lot of, and everything that has happened since 2006 has unfolded very much as predicted. So there isn't a real opportunity now to, you know, reinvent the wheel and come up with something that is, you know, complete 180 with respect to the single family residential. If this was a multifamily development, which was, you know, certainly supported in the OCP, then certainly this public engagement process would probably have a lot more teeth to it because it's a completely different animal than what was otherwise, you know, predicted from 2006 and it's got a form and character component which, you know, has a lot of personal preference ideas in it. But single family residential, it's pretty cut and dry as far as what you can and can't do and how you've got to do it. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay. I don't think there's any other questions. Thank you for your presentation and for the planner's input. So this matter will come out for a discussion under new business. So now we'll move on to minutes of meetings. So for approval of the March 15th regular council meeting. Approval. Second. Approval then. All in favor? Any opposed? Motion is carried. And for receipt of the committee to hold meeting minutes of March 22nd. Move for receipt. Second. All in favor? Any opposed? Motion is carried. Recommendation to establish a select committee to review options for council members' participation in the Nautical Days Parade. Move. Second. And any discussion? Just one question, staff. Are you seeking appointments to that committee at this time or is that something that you'll do at another time? We'll be bringing that forward at a later date. Okay. All right. Before Nautical Days. All those in favor? Motion is carried. All right. We'll leave that staff bring back to us. Okay. Manager report for receipts. Move for receipt. Second. And all those in favor? Motion is carried. Any questions or comments on manager reports? Just on the marina project. It's certainly come a long ways and we're still looking at mid-April completion, I understand. Yes, we are. And anticipating organizing a tour for council to have a look at the buildings at some point? The tour that we're proposing would commence just before the committee of the whole meeting, the second committee of the whole meeting in April. So April 26th. Okay. So let some information go around on that. All right. Any other questions? Seeing none, we'll move on then to the rezoning and DDP application 
16-3, 16-5 for 611 Colby Road, and this is for uh, adoption. Adoption. Movement. Second. Adoption. Any questions? Comments? Go ahead. Yeah, I still am opposed to this um, development. I, I look at it as uh, unfortunately a garage in the front of the yard that we're now allowing to become a home. It wasn't really the intent. And I think we're doing an injustice if we allow it. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? All those opposed? Two opposed? Um, I agree. Okay. <laughs> Motion is carried. All right. And for issuance of the permit, move. Second. Any discussion? So now, all those in favor? Those opposed? Yeah. Oh, one opposed. Yeah. Motion is carried. Okay, we'll move on to Regional District Meeting Minutes for Receipt. That's the Solid Waste Management Board, Hospital Board, Waste Energy Select Committee, and we'll receive all member of the Items Select Committee. <laughs> we'll receive all that. Thank you. I'll accept it all. All right, any discussion? Seeing that, all in favor? Motion is carried. And for consideration at first, second, and third reading is the uh, fire prevention uh, bylaw. And you'll note that this is entirely a new bylaw, but really it's done for the purpose of housekeeping. We're just incorporating the most recent attempt changes regarding the outdoor fireplace. Thing. But we upgraded it all to a consolidated bylaw. I'll move that. So I'll second that. <coughs> right, any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Motion is carried. It's interesting to note that uh, the presentation last night at the regional district that the fire uh, smoke was a very, well, almost unmeasurable. It was 0.0% in terms of <laughs> overall <laughs> yeah. PM 2.5. Yeah. So it's interesting to know. Of course, we do have uh, certain times of year when people can burn outside, which is principally in the summer. And then, of course, the PM 2.5s are higher in the winter, so maybe that's part of it. The, um, so first, second, third reading, it's all the new, second and carried. We'll deal with adoption next council meeting. And now uh, moving on to uh, new business, uh, we have the rezoning application, the development variance permit application for 1182 Lazo Road, consideration of first and second reading for the zoning map. Second. It will be seconded. Any discussion? Councilor. Yeah, I do have a few questions. Um, Drainage one, Councilor Price had answered. On, on page 84, we talk about affordable housing. And I just wanted to get a little bit of clarification. Um, we talk about the value of the property. It's 825000 So we are we basing our affordable housing numbers off of that? So that's pre-development um, cost, I'm assuming. Well, based on that worksheet? Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, staff can yes, that's pre rezoned Okay. And that's to keep it equal with somebody who is giving land mm -hmm. uh, so, at, on site. So I'm wondering why we wouldn't be looking at, you know, these 19 lots, assuming they're, you know, $300,000, and my mind's not quick enough to figure that out at the top of my head right now. But why wouldn't we base it on that afterwards, you know, because this is... 825000 is nothing compared to what these, this property is going to be worth because as it stands, we're getting just over $13,000 towards our affordable housing when I believe we could get more. Okay, good question. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if staff have any further response to what you said. That is the um, existing policy or existing direction. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I know that... Uh, um, we've also had concerns raised about sort of the burden that we're placing on the development industry through many uh, contributions um, and uh, through processes and what, what we're asking them to analyze. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the things that, um, quite frankly, has to be balanced by the community. Um, and if there's further direction or input from the council, um, we'd be happy to research that for you. But that's the present yeah. balancing point. Thank you. I, I do believe it's worth some investigation as we move along and I'm fully cognizant of the costs that it is for these developers, but 
$13,000 when we have a real serious issue of affordable housing in this community. I think we all need to do something a little bit more, and I don't think they'd begrudge having to pay a little bit more, so that way we can keep people in our community. So, but thank you very much, and, 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 and we, will, we will tackle that another time, I'm sure. Um, we talked about the, uh, the Greenway walkway. Now, I know that's been something like 10 years in making that we're at at this point, and I'm wondering if, uh, through the mayor to our CAO, do we actually have any tangible time frame when we could look at that walkway? Because now, if we go ahead with this development, we're going to connect the bottom of that backwards L, if you will. And, and I do believe with more homes in that area, more people, that we do need this walkway in there. And um, you know we're, we're looking at yes, perhaps Lazo will be widened. That will be a proper shoulder. But we're we're looking right now in regional district where we want to go from Comox to Courtney and have a separate walkway. I think this is you know this is perfect timing for us to maybe look at this a little bit more and and maybe you know down the road when we could have it in our budget so that we could have a walkway. There are parts of it already in our uh, five-year capital plan. So yes. We do have parts of it identified, and, and uh, as, as the drawing showed, the, the parcel right on the corner um, is still subject to a development application, right. which we would anticipate to come forward in the near future, given yeah. that it's currently listed for sale. Mm -hmm. um, so it, the time frame of, of uh, development of this greenway is actually front of mind with the park superintendent. Okay. So uh, I think you'll see something within the next few years. Yeah. And being mindful that, yes, that is now another greenway where our parks people have to yep. maintain, which, you know, uh, we're always uh, hindered by, by manpower and costs and so on. But I do think as that area starts to grow, whether people like it or not, it will. And we need to be mindful of having the proper walkway of that area. Thank you. That's all the questions. Okay. Yeah. Next week you'll see the uh, second draft of the budget, and then there is the five-year capital plan, and you'll be able to refer to what years it's being proposed for. Okay. Thank you. Um, just on the affordable housing contribution, cash and loan amount, I guess the challenge that you're going to have to consider when this issue does come back is whatever costs you add to the development of this property, whether it's this kind of levy or DCCs or other kinds of uh, contributions, uh, ultimately, it's the end user that pays for them. Mm -hmm. So the more you tack on to a development, the more the prices of the lots are going to be, mm -hmm. arguably, the less affordable they're going to be. So uh, just keep that in mind. I know that, for example, in the city of Victoria, they have uh, extracted levies out of development on what we call the lift of the value, as you referred to, uh, certain percentages uh, of the lift. And it was not without its controversy. Uh, of course, bigger projects there with a lot more density so in many respects, I think it was a negotiation. But it's certainly something worth discussing. You just have to factor in that affordable housing um, levies will, by their definition... Make houses in affordable. Yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, divided over 19 lots, I agree, it's yeah. less than $1,000 uh, per, per lot. But you know, when you add the other costs associated with mm -hmm. development, um, developers will tell you that... Uh, they're significant uh, you know, in, in the, in the uh, allocation of the lot price. Right. Yeah, and I don't know the answer, but I do believe it's worthwhile for well, us that's a good to discuss yeah. at some point. Well, and uh, 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 along the walkway, it's my understanding that we've been waiting for that corner lot to sell to, in order to be able to start doing, doing that piece. And it's kind of, uh, I know the owner, and it's kind of good to see that it's got a uh, sign on and it's for sale and they're more actively looking at, at selling it but I think that that's been the, the real hold up on that because I, I agree with you that's a that's a great piece of property mm -hmm. um, and, and that walkway would be uh, I think it's well needed all the way down mm -hmm. and along that that stretch um, especially when you get down to the beach down there and I know we've got to go through some regional district areas to get there but it's getting to the point where the, the traffic is busy enough and it's getting dangerous as you you know, if you're on a bike out that way, you would, you would know, especially going up that little hill. There's, I don't know how to, how to get around that, but uh, um, it's certainly very popular for that kind of activity, and it's anything but perfect right now. So I think that getting that piece started would be a real, real asset for us. So. Yeah. 
Yeah, and it is good to hear, and we have had discussions with MOTI officials, both uh, the Ministry and Victoria and here, around some of their roadworks and mm -hmm. improvements that hopefully they'll make in the whole Vaso Road area. So. All right, anything on first else? Go ahead, uh, Price. Yes, and just uh, while we're on the, uh, the Greenway, and, and we are putting more people into that, that area. There is a lot of people who do cross Lazo Road uh, to go to down the other side of Butchers to go to the steps. It's, it's really popular, mm -hmm. and it, it is really dangerous too. It's uh, traffic's quite mm -hmm. fast, and then you have that dip. And, um, Particularly with kids and small children. Yeah, and you, you get a lot of kids on little bikes and dog mm -hmm. walkers. It is, it is really quite busy now. And uh, so having, uh, and given that the ministry is looking at road improvements too, having some uh, crosswalk, it would need lights, and we could have you know, solar lights uh, on. That would be up to the ministry. Is this, can we not spearhead that too, though, because that's all part of um, what we're creating, and particularly when we've got that greenway uh, completed, you will find that a lot of those people will be heading to um, either to look out over Goose Pit, it's a very popular lookout point, or to go down the steps down. Perhaps it's something in the integrated uh, committee that, that the regional district can look at. And staff are. Yeah, and I, mean, so I think uh, many people mentioning things is, sure. uh, and I've had it mentioned to me too. But well, the best thing that people should do, quite frankly, in the experience recently with the Guthrie uh, Road uh, widening uh, by Sims Farm, is that if people write letters directly to the ministry, mm -hmm. uh, we can have as many meetings as we want, but when they have a stack full of letters, mm -hmm. that work got done. And, and so that, quite frankly, is the most effective way. Um, we can exert our influence, um, but ultimately it's the ministry's budget that it's going to have to come out of. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it worked in that location, so why can't it work elsewhere? Okay. Okay. Councilor Just a mm -hmm. quick, quick point in regards to affordable housing. Uh, uh, you cited uh, your worship uh, Victoria um, example. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if there might be might be worthwhile to look at some examples for municipalities on that and closer to our size, and to see if there's a varying rate on what they uh, charge for developmental cost uh, towards. Sure. The when it comes housing. time to getting a staff report on that, I'm sure they will. And do that research, but at this point, we haven't given that direction. So. No, no. And that would be another discussion that we'd have to have. Councillor Arnott's uh, points are here. Yeah, that's uh, certainly uh, relevant in, in some way to this application, but uh, we're applying a policy that we have to this point to uh, look at revising that policy would be another matter altogether, of course. Mm -hmm. Anything else at first and second reading? Seeing none, all those in favor? Motion's carried. And for the phase development agreement authorization uh, for first and second reading? Move. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Motion's carried. And that a public hearing be scheduled at the stair center. Please <coughs> Move. Second. Move and second. Any dates in mind yet, or are you still working on that? Still working. Okay. All those in favor? Motion's carried. Okay, so we'll move on to the next item of new business, which is the Ryan Road uh, Planning Report uh, CBRD Referral and Zoning and Settlement Expansion Area. I move the recommendation. Second. Okay, so move and second on the recommendation. Discussion. And this recommendation is that uh, the Town of Hallmark subjects to this amendment, but there being insufficient information provided to demonstrate consistency with the regional growth strategy as detailed in this report. So uh, there's a report there with background. Um, the council members have questions or concerns. Just yes. wondering, this is the second time that we've had one of these come to us with what we consider to be insufficient mm -hmm. um, stuff. It, is this going to be a standard sort of thing that happens, or, or why is this continually happening? Why, why are we not getting the kind know. of information that we want, or how do we how do we rectify that? The last one was fishing game club, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Byron, do you have any comments? I think that um, the actual um, conflict with the RGS has been quite minimal to date. And so even though it's been in effect well, since 2011 at least, um, experience amongst staff um, with it um, 
quantity is minimal, and I would see these as sort of initial learning steps. Um, also, what's happened at the regional district is um, they have had a very large uh, staff turnover from when the RGS was created um, to now, and um, some of that sort of corporate knowledge on the RGS may not be there. Um, the, uh, the one thing I can say is that we have had, I mean, um, a very respectful, professional um, dialogue with the RG, uh, with the regional district staff um, in terms of being able to discuss these issues. Um, and uh, my understanding is, yes, the Fish and Game Club um, did come to a resolution um, or at least a direction now uh, in alignment with the OGS, or more in alignment with the OGS. So my next question is, this is a referral from the regional district. Um, if they want to, they can just go ahead and disregard our, mm -hmm. if, they, if they choose to, they can just go ahead and do what they like, or does this have any weight, or are we just complaining? Um, I would assume it would have substantial weight um, within the organization because they're, um, I mean, I would expect that uh, either um, they're going to review the regional growth strategy, see if there's any contradictory policies or that mean that what they're proposing, what the applicant's proposing is uh, consistent. Um, the, the provincial statute is quite clear on the limitations on our regional growth strategy. Once it's enacted, they can't do anything in, in, in contravention of the regional growth strategy. So it, it, it has the same power as our OCP. Um, and similarly, to councils, people can do pass bylaws um, that are in conflict, um, but then they are subject to legal challenge. Um, and. Um, I believe that would also be subject to considerable discord um, in the region amongst the uh, participating partners. Uh, right now, we need more discord. <laughs> yeah. And it was interesting because we um, there was really good uh, turnout from the local government staff at the uh, RGS Open House um, that was held a couple of weeks ago. It was um, very well staffed, um, and it was very. There, while there was interest, it was clear that it was not a hot topic. And I think that that really reflects the fact that there has been cooperation on the RGS, and it has done what it was supposed to do, which was stop the rural, um, or limit the rural um, urban conflict. Um, so there are some, I guess what I'm saying is there, is, there are some positive, definitely some positive um, movements. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, just acknowledging the aspects of this particular application, um, basically allowing for a, a split zoning issue to be resolved uh, towards commercial, which of course um, the smaller portion of this property is being currently used for that. Um, I'm just wondering, um, I understand the concerns that have been raised in this report, but I'm just wondering why there would be at least some consideration of that ras rationalization taking that parcel and getting rid of the split zone on it. Any comments? Um, the, uh, <coughs> the split zoning is the amount that is commercial, um, is commercial zoning, um, C1 zoning, um, is actually very small. Mm -hmm. um, on page uh, 268, you can see the property, um, mm -hmm. just going off memory, so it's the property south of the, um, I guess that's a uh, statutory right of or something that bisects the property. So it is a substantial rezoning in mm -hmm. terms of area. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the, in the RGS it is quite clear in the intent of the settlement expansion areas. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, you know, I'm a pretty firm believer that everybody has a valid reason for seeking a rezoning of the land. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I don't believe that if you open the door, um, that um, it's going to be very difficult to distinguish. I mean, there's people who, you know, probably have been in their family for tens of generations, 
you know, we've had it within our own municipality where it's somebody's retirement fund. Um, why is this being stopped? Um, so, um, hopefully that provides the answer you're looking for. And I, but also this area has essentially become a commercial late industrial warehousing type area, and this parcel would presumably be one of the few parcels that isn't been developed to that extent. I mean, if you look at the uh, air photo on page 269, you can see all around it's been developed pretty much to that extent. So aren't they really asking for that same kind of use? Yes. And the reason we would object to that is we feel that it should be done. If it's going to be done like that, it should be done within a municipality that's going to be uh, serviced um, to that extent. Well, I guess I can go back to the, to the RGS. The RGS was really designed to address two, well, it, it, it addressed a number of issues, but there were two primary things. One was rural protection, and there was a feeling that rural areas uh, needed protection from ever-increasing boundary extensions. Mm -hmm. um, municipalities on the, same, on the same hand were feeling that, um, one, they should be able to meet demand for uh, growth. Two, that the development on the fringes without services was competing and undercutting their ability to finance mm -hmm. development within the municipal boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, and the settlement expansion areas really took a look at the existing fringe areas around the municipalities um, and said that that is a reserve. Um, and uh, municipalities, when they go into that reserve for boundary extensions, can only do so to do intensive development and full services on the grounds that, um, on the grounds that that would limit their future boundary extensions. Make, if you're going to do a boundary extension, get the most amount of development on it, so you reduce the demand on future boundary extensions. That logic doesn't differ whether that development is within the regional district. So the um, was it a hard line? Yes, um, but that was the line that the RGS drew. Um, it also has the same the same implications for us. If we're doing a boundary extension, it's not. Um, it has to be developed to sustain sustainable standards um, and um, try to maximize the use of the land um, as opposed to anything else to relieve the uh, to ensure that there's less pressure on the rural landscape. Okay. I mean, from the RD's report, they're saying that the proposed rezoning from residential to an appropriate commercial industrial zone to make the property one zone that is consistent with the neighborhood should not preclude future redevelopment in the area when the property is annexed to municipality. And I can understand what you're saying in terms of the settlement expansion area when it comes to residential zoning, smaller lots, and so on. Um, but in this case, I'm looking at it and trying to rationalize how those concerns pertain to a commercial zone like this, which the area around it is all commercial. I can understand the servicing concerns, the fact there's limited, if any, DCC is applicable. But when you're, you're really looking at that whole area now, already it's commercial and it's not likely to be developed as residential. That, that, it just puzzles me why uh, we would be taking that perspective on it as opposed to like if you're looking for a small lot subdivision in residential terms. Yeah. Um, a lot of it's the service. It's the servicing issue, like, um, yeah. and we've experienced this with with boundary extensions. Um, uh, if the land is is already developed and it's not um, in a uh, municipality, then it goes into an area to, to 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 allow for development. Anybody who is parcels that are already developed have no interest in developing or contributing to. Um, infrastructure upgrades, and so you create these kind of mm -hmm. holes of a lack of, of interest in provision of infrastructure, and then that's either borne by the remaining landowners, um, mm -hmm. essentially they have to bring services across the already developed property, mm -hmm. um, or it's then borne by the taxpayer as a capital project. But presumably that whole strip of land all the way down right towards the base is going to be under the same parameters, right? Um, I don't. Well, I mean, they're all commercial. They're all have their own services. So if and when it does come to the municipality, that issue will have to be addressed for that whole area. 
not just for that property. Yes, and, and that is something that those kind of contingencies, I don't believe, are something that the RGS right. got into. Again, it was, it's, it, they're, they're somewhat blunt tools. Yep, I'll do it. That's okay. Yeah, well, I appreciate what you said about the fact that being commercial property uh, mostly, but is the risk not too great still for our municipality if there are some that are carved off as, uh, uh, as uh, in, in a different category there, uh, that we, we would be stuck with paying for the services then in the long run. So we have to be mindful of protecting our taxpayers, and uh, uh, I just uh, I, I don't see how we can justify that from, uh, from our end. And, and, and uh, I, it seems to me that these properties would have to pay for their fair share of servicing. Yep, the servicing issue is definitely a troubling one. The land use one I'm not so troubled about on this, this particular context given the neighborhood there, but I do understand the servicing. Well, the motion is to get more information, obviously, to tell them that you don't uh, like what they're doing without more information to how it's going to be consistent with the RDS. So, anything a lot further on that motion? Seeing now, all in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Okay, so we'll move on now, I believe, to correspondence. Uh, we will be seated the town, uh, the Tomahawk Town Residents Association. Okay. Um, I just moved and seconded on the seat of the letter. All those in favor of the seats. Motion's carried. And just, just a quick comment. This, uh, this is an interesting letter for me. I think this is the first issue that I ever brought up when I first came to council some <laughs> 340 years ago or whatever it was. So it's interesting that it's still, it's still around. But um, we have made a lot of headway on this. And um, I, I would say that uh, we spend a substantial amount of our gas tax money every year on sidewalks. And I know we have a plan for where we're going to put them into, into use. And I know it's kind of confusing because you can walk down the street and then change sides and, and all of that. But I, I also remember being very aghast at how much a block of sidewalk cost. Mm -hmm. So you don't get a whole lot of bang for your buck. That's one of the issues. But So um, I certainly appreciate where this letter comes from and, and uh, I know we've taken a lot of steps, but I'm just wondering if these particular roads, I think they're talking to Noel to, or Dogwood to Pritchard, um, are they somewhere on our radar to be done at some point in time in the near future? Do you know that? The engineer's not here. So. Uh, I, I don't believe that the Noel Avenue additional sidewalk is, uh, given, given that it's, although you believe that it's been a long time, it's actually been yeah. recent in terms of the redevelopment of that street. He's just getting old again. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and uh, and I am I'm, I'm not sure, and I will clarify whether we have uh, sufficient right of way in that area to okay. even consider a sidewalk yeah. uh, on, on the south side of Mill. Some of the other areas mentioned, you know, as, as you're aware, the yeah. Oford Avenue uh, work that we've done in the last few years was these are conscious decisions to have sidewalks only on one side of the street. Uh, the Comox Avenue one is definitely on our radar. Um, given some of the, the great issues in some areas, it will not uh, be a cheap build. Uh, but we are, we are looking at, at the arterials and looking at uh, sidewalks on both sides. Well, and, and you know, for, for me back in the day, it, was, it wasn't whether you had two sidewalks. It was the coming down the street and they go to here and then it would stop and then you'd cross the street here and then it would go back right. up there. To, to just be contiguous, I think, is, is as important as having... I, I realize the cost of having on both sides. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Nothing further on that letter. Uh, those comments will be noted in our response. Um, we do have also a letter there from uh, Wendy Profilo regarding thanking the staff. Remove for seat. Sorry. Yeah. So, uh, on the seat then. All those in favor? Motion is carried. Can I make a motion that we turn the air conditioning off? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's a lot No late items or other delegations, reports, or members of council. I will go first uh, for the month of March, uh, since it wasn't here since March 1st, the council meeting on this reference a bunch of things that have occurred um, already this spent on the Mayor's Cup on the Councillor Grant for uh, representing on that and attended the see that's board meeting on our Sunshine Coast Regional Advisory Committee of the Town Coast Economic Trust, which of course uh, 
was uh, on the heels of the announcement of the $10 million top-up funding from the province for that. And of course, we also had the Island Coastal Economic Trust board meeting to talk a bit more about the parameters for that. So there'll be some more information to follow on that, how that will roll out. We don't have the $10 million in our bank account yet, but there will be a process where that will happen. The Elder College asked me to speak to them on regional Comox Valley issues, governance issues, and town Comox issues, so I did that. And I attended the BC Shellfish Festival lunch, uh, which occurred the time of the last council meeting. RCAF had their 93rd anniversary mess dinner. Uh, Note, uh, the commander retired, Stocky Edwards, and his 97th year was there. He's actually older than the Air Force. It's quite remarkable to see him uh, still alive and doing very well, of course. Uh, meeting with the Campbell River Mayor and Economic Development uh, this week just to talk about some opportunities around the BC Shellfish Seafood Festival. They're going to be doing some tours of salmon farms as part of that coming up in June. And the elected officials forum last night uh, on air quality. And also gave the town's thanks to Don McRae on his retirement due the other night and thanked him for all his efforts uh, to uh, help us obtain infrastructure funding uh, whenever the opportunity is presented. So, of course, we can see evidence of that all around the community. And that's my report. So we'll move on to Councilor Murkett. Thank you. Uh, I start with the seniors. We had a St. Patrick's dinner that was a solid event, and it was really a good, a good evening. I attended their board meeting, also attended the AGM for the Comox Museum and Archives, it was well done. Uh, Judy Newton gave a, an excellent presentation on the churches. Uh, also attended the Don McRae thank you dinner. It was, was well attended and our mayor represented as well. And also attended the air quality forum. And it's Shelley's birthday today. That's a tough act to follow when it comes to your just briefly, I went to the uh, Guys and Dolls reception at Sid Williams Theatre, uh, uh, representing the town. I had two homeless coalition meetings, uh, March 24th and today. Uh, March 15th, the uh, Comox Archives and Museum uh, AGM as well. Uh, Chamber of Commerce open house last Wednesday. Uh, Comox Lazo Forest Reserve AGM at the uh, uh, rec center here on the Thursday the 30th. I uh, was acting mayor at the RCMP student at Camp Grad at HMCS Quadrant. It's been uh, operating since 1996, every two years, and the town of Comox uh, uh, support has been greatly appreciated, and that was mentioned by many there, so great event. And uh, Comox Valley Social Planning Committee meeting today, and finally attended the uh, CBRD Air Quality Workshop like an officials forum yesterday. And on the way home, thought I'd stop at your tell your MLA what you need all candidates meeting at the uh, uh, Comox First Nations last night. And uh, many people told the, the prospective MLAs what they thought they needed. Council Brace. Yes, I attended uh, two regional district board meetings, uh, basically about the budget, and the budget was approved. Um, I attended the AGM for uh, Comox Archives and Museum Society and also for the Friends of Comox Lazo Forest Reserve. Uh, I attended uh, MFA AGM Victoria, which actually was very interesting. It had some incredible speakers. I think it this guy, Angelo Catasaurus, who was a geopolitical anal ana analyst, and he just could jump from country to country and uh, yeah, so that, that is, if you ever get the chance, it's well worth it. And I was at the airport presentation. Great, thank you. Councillor Swift? Uh, my report's very short, having been away on holidays. Uh, I attended the forum on the air quality last <laughs> And where were you holidaying? <laughs> well, she was holidaying. Hey, in the I, I did look park. at the syringe treatment plan. And yeah, that's uh, so uh, yeah, so your friend, I just saw it. Councillor Nutt. So uh, I did attend the uh, Philburg AGM on behalf of oh, Councillor uh, Swift, and it was, um, it was a good meeting. Um, new, new Guard is taking over for the Philburg, and uh, I think they're uh, going to continue on with the great work they do there. And I attended last night's air quality uh, meeting at the regional district as well. Great. 
Yeah. And I also attended the budget meetings at the regional district where the budget was passed and the air quality forum last night. All right. That's it. Great. Thank you for all those reports. Any questions from the media this time? Any questions from the member of the public this week? <laughs> Okay. Uh, no other items for our agenda tonight, so motion to adjourn. Move. Sorry. In favor? Meeting.